cross-cultural evangelism. It's a, it's, it's a great theme. Um, and um, I was thinking, as I was thinking about this theme, probably uh, the, how can I preface it, the, the thought, or like, why are we doing this, or um, what am I getting ready for? And it's, in Bible school, we're getting prepared to be, un, we're getting prepared for something that we're not prepared for. That's why we're in Bible school, because do you understand? We're getting prepared for something we're not prepared for. So actually, tonight is about warfare. And um, if we saw the warfare or the conflict, we are, not, we are not prepared for that. And what Satan, what Satan has against God, um, um, and when we see it in a... In a in a visible way, uh, uh, we're, ne- we're, we're, only, we're not prepared for that, but we're prepared for it because we're preparing for the unprepared. Do you see what I'm saying? Something we're not prepared for. Because m- many times in this cross-cultural uh, evangelism, uh, we have many inhibitions, and uh, sometimes, you know, I don't want to, like, because it's actually tonight we're gonna watch. We got I got four videos we're gonna watch, and um, and I'm gonna comment during them and after them. But you really gotta have ears to hear tonight to listen to these videos, okay? And like because we're we're in a um, we're in a vision from God. God has a vision for our lives, and I was reading. Ephesians chapter, if you read Ephesians chapter 3, what a chapter. And it starts with this, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Like, like Paul is a prisoner for the Gentiles. And like we're not we're not prepared to be a prisoner. Um, we're not prepared for what's in front of us, but we're prepared to have a relationship with God. And Ephesians chapter three is very unique because it's about this is so important. This is so important when we have cross cultural evangelism. Paul wants this church of Ephesus to be involved in a mystery. They have to get it. Like we learned on Wednesday night, Pastor Schaller spoke about the accuracy of love and the suspicion of science, right? Science is so suspicious. When our, when our Christianity is disjointed because we're, we're like, we're, it, we think it's scientific, we can figure it all out, and we don't enter into the mystery of the authority of love, then we, we miss everything. And when we don't get knit into the body of Jesus Christ, uh, and I, I, it's like, we've got to throw that out, or we've got to, we got to re, continually redefine this in our life. We must be, Paul wanted the, the, the people of Ephesus to be knit into the body of Christ, that together, that they would experience the height, the length, the width, with lit, the width, width, and the depth of God's love. Like, together. That was the goal. And it doesn't exist if I am isolated from the body of Jesus Christ. Because the body is the fullness of of God. It is the fullness. So Paul's Paul's desire, and and this is the only way that we can be unified. Because otherwise, what are we doing? We're we're living... We're living um, uh, eye for eye. We're living, judge, we're living in, um, you could say, like tit for tat. He did that to me, I do that to him. And we're not living in the mystery. 
I mean, this is either about faith or it's not. Right? This is either about a God being big and us, what did John the Baptist say? I must decrease. That's how we enter into the mystery, is when I decrease. And um, like the, I said in the beginning of the class, it, this is not about me being prepared to evangelize, to, to go. It is I am preparing for what I am unprepared for. This is, this is our goal in Bible school. And it's like, we have vision. We have vision. God is going to do something. God is going to make teams. God is going to send people, you know, throughout the world. Like, this is, this is God's desire. Okay? And God is going to use me in that plan. Because I'm part of the body of Jesus Christ. We have a very unique opportunity in our church because we're a missions a mission-minded church, but we're still a local church, okay? This is very unique. When you come back, you come back from the mission field to a local church. You don't come back and you don't know where you are. And I remember when I came back, I just was like, help me find my place. And because I was in the body, and just as long as I kept saying that, help me find my place, because I knew there was a place for me when you come back. It was, and it was amazing how you can actually fit into the body of Christ because we're not preserving our life, we're losing our life, we're decreasing, and God is increasing. So tonight, um, I think one of, the, one of the, the, the greatest spiritual, the, the wars, the greatest spiritual wars is about going. I'm not going to share uh, what I prepared here tonight on that. Uh, as soon as Sebastian comes back in, I'm gonna, we're going to watch the first video. But I just want to say there's a warfare. There's a warfare about going. There's a warfare about me going. Okay, whether it's, whether it's me. Tonight, by the way, at, in, at a little after 7, we're, or at 7 o'clock, we're going to go out and we're going to go with the teens and we're going to practice what we see here tonight and what we learn in class. Okay, whoever wants to go will be back by 9.30. You're on the bus, and uh, we'll go out doing evangelism with the teens, okay? That's what we're going to do tonight, okay? Because um, uh, this is about uh, evangelizing, and it's about uh, cross-cultural uh, experiences. And so uh, go. Go is always a... Um, this is... And I'm, this is that's one. I'm not going to talk any more about that. Um, um, something that happens, something that is going to happen. If we can just turn to Ephesians chapter, I mean uh, Matthew chapter f uh, five. Turn to Matthew chapter five. Persecution is amazing. Pastor Love didn't he spoke? He spoke about suffering, and they were the ones that had been win with Jesus Christ. And, and there, there's, there's nothing more precious in our life than persecution. And, like, and like you say, like, how do I prepare for it? You don't prepare for it, but we are preparing for it. We're never prepared for it. Persecution is one of the, it is, it is one of the most beautiful fires when you go through persecution. It is like, it's, ref, it's the, one, of the most, um, um, one of the most purifying experiences we can have in our life. It's, um, and just, just look at Matthew chapter 5, and uh, you probably know where I'm going to go in verse 10. Blessed, blessed, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Persecuted for righteousness' sake. I'm following God with all my heart. I'm adjusting to mercy. I, I love the body of Christ. It's like, I, I, I'm, I'm going forward with God. It's like there's, there's some prayer in my life. I'm reading the word. I believe in reaching the lost. Blessed are those that are persecuted for right. Blessed, blessed. There, there's there's, there's this, this happiness, this internal happiness when we are persecuted. And not this persecution where we try to bring it onto ourselves because we love it. Sebastian, are you there? Okay, Sebastian is here. Okay, so, and then you can read the rest of that. 
Um, I'm not going to read these. So just listen to these. Listen to these very closely. This is about cross-cultural evangelism. We've got four. I'm going to stop after each one or maybe in the middle if I want to say, probably just at the end. And uh, at the end of each one, we'll say something. So the first one, these are from New Tribes Missions. And so uh, just get your heart ready and let's listen. Okay, go ahead. When we found out the tragic custom of, uh, of the Hewa people, how they murder their own people, they believe that there's evil spirits inside of some of these women and children. And so they believe that the only way to get rid of an evil spirit is to go and kill that woman or children. When we found out those things, we were just torn to the heart. We couldn't believe it. How could they just go and kill, brutally kill their own people like that? It tore us up. And we thought, what are we doing here? Why are we even here? We're in this culture, this self-destruct culture, where it's never going to change. We tried to talk to different people, and we would say, hey, stop, stop. What are you doing that for? And they would look at us and say, why, why? Because they were thought, they thought, when they were in their ancestral track there, in the, on that path of the ancestors, they actually thought they were doing good by killing their own sisters and relatives, trying to save a village. They thought that if they would kill a person with an evil spirit, then, then there would be no sickness and death. They actually thought eternal life was possible, that you could actually live forever if you could get all the spirits of the jungle in harmony with each other, if you could keep the ancestral spirits, people who had died, if you could keep the ancestral spirits happy, you could live forever. Your, your traps would be successful, your, your hunts would be successful, your traps would always catch game. When we saw that they were caught, locked in this, and that there was no hope, it was hard to stay. It was hard to love them. So what kept us coming back? It's that belief in the power of the Word. God says His Word is powerful. God says His Word will change lives. But after a while we realized their plight and our sadness for their plight, our pity for them, wasn't enough to keep us there. It had to be something that God did in our lives, a special love. It's Christ's love that compels us. His love for us, His forgiveness for us, and then also realizing He's got that same love that he wants to offer to these Hewa people. It's that understanding of Christ's love that keeps us coming back. And oh my word, when they catch that, when they see how much Christ has loved them, so much that he would pay their ransom, pay their punishment, take care of their sin debt, when they catch that and understand the incredibleness of Christ's love, that's all they want to talk about. Oftentimes, oftentimes, when we come to church and they're the ones that are teaching the Word, one of their very favorite passages is John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. They realize this is incredible. This love of God is incredible. The spirits never loved us. We had to spend our, our lives placating, appeasing, manipulating spirits to try to stay alive, to try to exist. Our spirits never loved us. They were just making fun of us. They were just killing us. God loves us. When they caught that, it was an amazing truth to them and they've latched on to it. Another favorite passage is Romans 8. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. No kind of trial, no kind of trouble will ever separate you from the love of God. Those are their favorite passages. When they discovered the love of God, they have continued to go back to those passages. Okay, that's the first one. Um, this represents any city in Europe. This represents any location where a missionary, where a missionary would go. Um, there, there are spirits, and they're killing themselves. And these, this situation, and they're locked into these spirits, and they're self-destructive. And when we go cross-culturally, we see that. And what's, what he said there is, is true. It's hard to love the people. Like you just, it's just like, it's like impossible to love the people. I remember that, like it was in Germany and it's like, it's just hard to love these people. You see their culture, you see their hardness, you see, you start to see their, their, their connection to the spiritual world and you just think it's impossible. And you, and you walk out of your street in the morning, you know, your quiet little house and all of a sudden you see thousands of people, you hop on a train and it becomes overwhelming, it's too big for you. But God has to do, like we're not prepared for that, but we're prepared 
that we realize that God loves me. He said he realized that this, the word of God was powerful. And we start to believe and we start to trust in this to do its effectual work in people's lives. And all of a sudden, we have this hope as we're ministering cross-culturally. And then uh, we saw the conversion of that man. And those conversions do happen. We labor on the fields cross-culturally, and it's like they happen. Like people get unlocked from their spiritual world. Doesn't God give them the power to become the children of God? God unlocks them from the, those spirits. And this is why, this is why, um, this, is, I, this is just a picture. I just thought of like a village or a city in Italy or in Germany when I was watching this. And it's just like, it, it could be anywhere in the world. It could be my little community. And this, this, is, this is the warfare that we're involved in. Like people are killing themselves, their spirits, their strongholds that, that people can be released from. And we, if we try to do it naturally, you will not love the people. And you'll be there and say, I'm not prepared for this. But we're prepared to, 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 to draw our resources from God and give them to people. And then they're unlocked through the power of the word. And I'm able to love them. So this is, that is beautiful. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. And this is a, a story about a conversion of a, of a guy in that village. This is a disciple. All around us in the valley live the chemo spirits that we fear. My father taught us that the evil spirits are alive and living all around us. So we build our houses high in the mountains. We don't want the spirits to look into the house and see us and bring sickness. So we line our house with bark on the inside. If we hunt in the valley, we return quickly and always take a dog with us to protect us from the spirits. Be careful, my father would say, so the spirits don't eat you. We didn't understand the reason for death, and so we lived in fear. My father, Alimpu, killed many people that he thought had evil spirits living in them. He believed that these people were the cause of the sickness and death, and so he killed them. I followed the same dark trail. But God allowed a great sickness to come to our village, and we were all very afraid. We thought that we were all going to die. Three graves were already outside my house when God sent Jonathan and Yanis to put medicine in our mouths. To our surprise, we were soon able to sit up and look around. We hadn't died, but instead returned to life. This made me want to hear what the foreigner had to say. We invited them to come teach God's words, and we celebrated with a pig feast. God's spirit came and helped my heart to think. I realized that I had been living in darkness. My eyes were blinded, my mouth unable to speak truth, and my heart was blocked from understanding. I was trapped like on a pig roll, tied by Satan to my ancestors' trail. Jonathan cleared a new trail for me to follow, but it was truly Jesus who came to rescue me when I understood the message of Jesus and how he died. It was like Jesus came and cut the rope that was tying me. I was free, free to follow his trail. I now understand that there is no other trail but the trail of Jesus. So you've heard Fado's story. Won't you please pray, talk to the Lord, and ask Him 
if you can take a part in this effort to take the message of the Bible to a place it's never been. That's, that's a disciple. And, um, you know, these are people. You know, these aren't just, you know, sometimes we are fascinated by these tribes, but these are people, and they, they're represented in, in all of the world. In, uh, uh, they're represented in, in the United States, um, the country that you're from. These are, these are real people. And um, sometimes our world becomes so small. We're just, I'm just, just saying this. We're, we're interested in, we're interested in me receiving. You could say, like you could say, you could say this, like like I start to worship doctrine. I start to worship outreach. I start to worship Bible school, and we for, we, we we stop worshiping God, and God's heart for for people. And um, because when we worship God, we're going to find God's heart for people, okay? And, and we, 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 for God so loved the world, he gave. No greater love has a man than this, you know, it's like, than he give. Like God is this, this giving God. He came to redeem. He, came, he, he paid a price for people. And we're not just like, we're just not like getting, like, thoughts from the Bible for our own lives. It's like we're, pro we're part of the Great Commission of the, you could say, of the inner desires of God. And this is, this is what missions and cross-cultural evan evangelism is about. It's like we're next to the heart of God. And when, and when we're living like that, it's like you see our unity? You see what we're focused on? We're not focused on the, on the petty things. We're not focused on the things that are, uh, that are actually, we get distracted and we start, we start focusing on the wrong things. So this is a, this is a real person. This represents a, a disciple. You know, this represents to me like, like Stefan Stein. You know what I mean? That represents Stefan Stein. You know, like that's the way he was. You know, he had bark around his house. You know what I mean? And he was keeping out the evil spirits. He was trying to do good. His family was, you know, his, this guy's father was killing people to get rid of evil so they can get rid of evil and then give themselves eternal life. They're in their own good work system. You know, they, they're, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil exists. And I want to show them the tree of life. So this, this is possible wherever we go. And this is this is what we're praying for with, with Budapest coming up. Like, like these people can be strengthened in this vision. And like this, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing in uh, cross-cultural evangelism. And it says like his, he, the rope was cut that was binding him. He wasn't free. And it was like, it's like he, res, it's, like, it's, like, it's like, first of all, I, I, knew, I knew a boy that he, he, was, he lived in so much fear he couldn't open his mouth. He didn't even have mouth muscles because he lived in fear so long. He didn't say words for years. He just lived like that. And like God delivered him, and now he's a preacher. You know, he's using his, his mouth. And so, but he would live in so much fear because of his childhood and the way he was brought up and the way that he was punished that he, he just he couldn't even move his mouth. And like God had to set him free. And this is the spiritual world that's out there. Satan has them, them captive. So, um, and then the, this, this next one is about, is about going, because one of the greatest hindrances to, to evangelism, cross-cultural evangelism, is going. You know, Isaiah chapter 6, you know, who will go? Who will go? Like, who will, like, lose their life? Who will become a part of, like, the vision, the body of Christ, like, who will drop something and pick up the call of God? Who will go for me? You know, God was looking for, you know, asking Isaiah that. Who, who will? You know what I mean? Who, you know, who, who's going to go? Who will be that person that's associated with me, that's worshiping the right thing, the person that's going to go through persecution and I'm going to bless? Who's going to be that person? And it's like, who, you know, like, this is us. We're a part of a, of a church. We're part of, of the, the body of Jesus Christ. 
He's the head. And we're, like, we're saying, like, it can be me. Like, my, I can have a part in this. And, like, this is, this is this inward working in Ephesians chapter 3 that Paul wanted this mystery growing. And it speaks of this, this growing power inside of people, like this glory of God being delivered inside of people. People were just, like, getting fat on the glory of God. He wanted his churches to be like that so that they were so heavy with the glory of God. It's like, and that they'd be saturated with God. And like these, they're, then they're prepared for what they're not prepared for when they're saturated. Because he's in, Paul was in persecution. You know what I mean? Paul was a prisoner. Paul was in chains. And he, it's like, this is the only thing that prepares us. So this next one, this is about, this is about going. And this is about anywhere in the world. And this, this is a true story about anywhere in the world. Go ahead, Sebastian. Listen closely. What you see and hear in the next few minutes is what actually happened. Such events do not necessarily occur everywhere. However, God is placing a desire to know him in the hearts of men and women worldwide. I couldn't believe it. Here I was in Papua New Guinea. I joined this program called Destination Summit to help out the missionaries for several weeks by just doing some work. We met one night. We were all in the living room, and here come these two guys that come in, and they sit down, and you just haven't seen, you might have seen something in National Geographic, but it does not touch you or affect you, your emotions like anything when you're sitting there with them. They said they wished that they could talk to us personally in our language, but they knew they couldn't, so they wanted Bob and George to translate. Hello. Hello. Okay, he's saying where they're from is way back up in the hills, a place called Depalu, that is day's walk out there, out in the hills, out in the jungle. And we're just out there, and we belong to the devil, and we know it. And so we want someone to come up there to our land and come and tell us about God's word. Our women, our little children, and our old men, they can't come down here. So if someone could come up there and tell us, I think that would be good. Okay, if I could hear God's word, if I would be able to believe in God's word, boy, in my heart, I think that is really important. I think that would really be a good thing if I could do that. We were just stunned. We, we didn't know what to say. We wanted to tell them we could go so bad, but yet in our own hearts we weren't really prepared and we needed to think about it. So Bob told him that if they would come back tomorrow night, we would give them an answer. On the second night, the, the thing that hit the hardest and man, it just made you cry, is after we told them we can't send somebody to you, boy, we wish we could, but we just don't have anybody that we could send to you right now. Wadu stood up, and he a look on his face, of he was scared. As they started to leave, one of the guys turned around and said something in Basoyo, and we asked um, Bob what he said, and he said that he didn't want to go to hell. He didn't want to die and go to hell. And that was something that just broke me up, because... He knows what hell is, and he knows he's going there if, he, if nobody tells him. It just tore us up. We were quiet. No one said anything. After the meeting, we just kind of went off to be by ourselves and just think about it. I don't think any of us slept for the next three nights. Every night, everybody was just up and just thinking about it, just praying about it, thinking, what can I do? Though Gila Mossy and his friends left, Three weeks later, he came for the third time. Gilamase came again for the third time, and he just said, this is my last chance I have to talk to you guys. I'm going back to the hills soon. Hey, listen, here's what he's saying. He's saying, here are the people that are out in the hills. These are not the ones from here in Malaika. Wene, Wene, Wene. Yamayao, Wene, Wene, Yamayao. 
Because these are not the ones that live down here at this airstrip, but these are the guys that live out in the hills. He just stood there with, the, with just such a dejected look on his face. It was unreal. And so we all stood around and he pulled these sticks out of his belt, little sticks. And the way he tossed them down, he just kind of, just kind of a lazy hand motion, you know, just throwing them on the ground. Each stick had a name. Possibly hmm. and his wife. Sabio and Mainagi. Hmm. Sabio and Mainagi. Sabio and Mainagi. I'm throwing down a guy named Yolomai. Each stick had a name. And he's saying that each one of these people are going to go to hell if we don't have a missionary come. Look at all those sticks. Look at the names here just rattling off, name after name. Oh, just a dejected look on his face just ripped you apart. And oh man, it, just right then I just, oh, it, the anguish in my heart, I couldn't believe it. I, I bent down and started to pick up the sticks. And, oh. Tell him that um, I'll take these sticks back. And I'll show them to my people. People are pleading for people to come up and tell them about Christ. <laughs> These yeah. represent the people that are going to hell because we don't have enough people to send out. Possibly and his wife. Sabio and Mainagi. Yolofi. Mm, okay. Um. I, you you wonder when Pastor Shabelli says, you know, we're planning another church in in Africa, or we have, t you know, uh, twenty Bible school students in Pakistan, or. Pastor Carl is, we're, we're moving into Bangladesh. Um, Pastor Walsh into Burma. Pastor Steve goes next week into Japan. Um, Pastor Walsh travels to Cambodia and then next to Thailand in the, in the, in the kind of in the jungle area. Um, Matt Sleva is going with his wife to Malawi. Um, Pastor Mati is is making preparations for uh, Oman. Um, Oman. Um, uh, you you know uh, Haiti is on our heart because of Pastor Bill Cannon. And like, like, I, I even like, sometimes used to get disturbed when we talked about, you know, church planting and like. But I had to adjust my heart to say like, well, well, what, what are we doing? Like, what is it about? Like sometimes we wonder like, you know, like, well, I, I haven't really had that experience, or uh, I'm not. See, see the eyes. I haven't really had that experience. I really don't get that excitement. You see the eyes in that? And we, and like, you know, and we disassociate like what God is doing in, in you know, in the churches. Um, there's a group of people coming from Kaliningrad. Their pastor has died, you know, several years ago. Like what, what, what can we do there? You know, like how can we send someone some of the churches are smaller in Europe, like in Poland, 
you know, how can we help them? You know, like maybe there's some, ma- some sticks like that in Poland. Uh, maybe there's somebody in, uh, in Kansas City, you know. Um, and and it's, it's not like I have to become involved in it. It's like this is the heart of God. It's like getting connected to God. It's not, it's like I got to get some, stir up something. This is already exist in the heart of God to reach these people. It's not like something that is um, acquired through my diligence. It's like receiving love from God and getting closer and closer to God. And, and when, you're, when we're on the mission field, you do feel prepared. You do feel prepared. But you run into things you never even thought you would actually see in your life. And so, um, like, 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 go. Like, like this can be a, a vision that's in our heart. Like, this is a vision that's in the Bible school. It can be in our church. You know, there's summer harvest this summer. You know, I think of Pastor Hewlett in Albania. He takes a, his church to the seaside. And you could be there with that church, and you could do evangelism right down there. I think it's on the Adriatic Sea. And you could be with them. You know, like there's that summer harvest. Uh, I think Pastor Steve is going to do something in, in Japan. Pastor Schaller goes to India. Like there's so many places. Pastor Shabelli, you know, he will be doing his, I think his next trip is to Western Africa, right? I think what? South. South. South and East, next one. South and East. Okay. And, um, like, like, you know, like, the guys in that class over there, you know, like, they're going to be in this class. And, like, there's a progression. This is a missions, this is a missions-minded church. And because we're, we're connected. And you see how and, and automatically, when you're connected to the heart of God, how you have unity? It's like... That, that, that is Ephesians chapter 3. It's, it, it's, it's like this is, this is the, the, like in, first, in John chapter 3, like this, John was so, like his joy was full when he saw his church, his people living in truth. You know, not making idols. We're not making idols. You know, we're not making idols out of our families or you know, out of our possessions, or we're not making idols out of, out of Bible school. Bible school isn't the end of life, like Jesus Christ is, is the Alpha and the Omega. You know what I mean? Bible school is a means where we get to know the Alpha and the Omega. Evangelism isn't the thing that I do that proves that I know God. Evangelism is the heart of God, right? It's the heart of God. It's not the thing that I'm doing to show people that I'm really involved in this church. It's like where I get to know the heart of God. Church planting isn't like, you know, the endeavor where I get to show people, I, you know, I've got it together. I'm a good organizer. Like the church is where Christ is the head. And we just, we lift, we lift Christ up. We lift Christ up. And we don't need the honor. And we don't need the glory. But we lift Christ up. Because, you know, you know, when people are lifting themselves up and they call that church planting, it doesn't work. It's just a strife. And so this, this is, this is, these are the things that, that we, we do in our life. This, this gives us like longevity in the ministry when we're connected to, to, to Christ. So, um, and then this is, this will be the last one. We'll listen to this one. This is about uh, that couple that ministered to the two previous uh, videos, that, cu- that couple and their experience about leaving America and going. So we got married and uh, started lives together. Susan uh, thought she would like to become a nurse. So she was studying and started a little company. And before you knew it, years were passing while we were there in the States. While we were in business and in school and had our first and second child, we started falling into that groove of the, of the American dream, right? Uh, thinking about how much money we could make and retire early. And we thought, well, we'll just, uh, instead of being missionaries, we'll support missions and uh, possibly retire early and be self-supporting going to uh, Papua New Guinea, something like that. But the Lord wouldn't let me rest. I was restless. I realized that I was living full time for myself, really, 
to make a living, but to make a retirement, to be secure, to be comfortable, all those kind of things. And that verse, Matthew 6, 33, bothered me all the time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And, and I realized I wasn't matching up to that. I was seeking first my kingdom, my financial status, my comfort, my whatever. It was all about us. And then um, over time we realized, you know what, we've got to make a break. So after six years, we made a break. We finally went with New Tribes Mission into their training. Finally started that process of coming to Papua New Guinea. When we got to Papua New Guinea, then we started hearing about the Hewa people and how they had been asking for missionaries. Something like seven or eight years they had been sending a delegation over the mountains. When we heard that, we wanted to find out more. And that's, that's what started this ball rolling and that's why we're here today. Okay, um, so that's a, a great, a great story. I remember in my own life, actually today I was reading, I, w I found, I hadn't seen it, my wife found it. Um, it was, uh, when I was in college, it was my, I've never kept a journal in my life, but it was the only journal I ever kept. And it was actually when God started to move in my life. And I went to uh, some friend's house for the Super Bowl in 1986, I think the Bears actually won that one. In 1986, yeah. And they played the New England Patriots because they were a Patriots fan. They knew I was from Chicago, so they invited me over. Right? They played the New England Patriots, I believe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I was going to school in Boston. And I said I came home from that party, and um, somehow, like, I was involved in the Campus Crusade for Christ at the time. But, and I was like planning this mission trip to Africa. And uh, somehow, like these are my friends from the previous year when I studied in London. We all gathered together for this Super Bowl party. And I, start, I remember actually writing these words. I was thinking earlier today, I remember writing these words. But, but I, I, I needed, I, I just remembered how the Holy Spirit, I wrote down there, I need the Holy Spirit to move in my life. It's like, 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 the Holy Spirit has to move in our life, like in Genesis chapter 1, you know, and like, like begin to take the void things, the undefined things, and bring definition to them. The Holy Spirit needs to, um, we need, like I was saying, like this, this mystery needs, it, it, it starts to develop in our life through the Holy, the Holy Spirit. We're not afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not subjective. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't um, equate or doesn't relate in our minds to emotionalism. It, it relates to a person. It relates to the nature of God. And it, 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 it shows us what Christ has done for us. And we need the Holy Spirit to move in our life. That's, we need that. And I remember I wrote that down. And then I said, I'm not ashamed. I said, like, I'm, I said the, word, the word has gotten out that I am like uh, in the ministry, in the ministry. And I was like, I was, you know, I was a senior in, in college. And I was like, like, this became like, like God was doing this work in my life. And I was excited about it. I was getting separated from my old friends. And I told my old friends, you know, I was at that Super Bowl party, and I must have told them, you know, like, this is what I'm doing. And, um, and I saw a list of my prayers back then. And it's amazing what God has done in my life, you know, when you see, you know, uh, what is that? It's almost 30, it's 28 years ago, right? It's 28 years ago that that happened. So it's, it's, uh, uh, like, like, like these, these, this is the work of God. And we're, we're, you know, and the other thing is we're cheering other people on. We're going to go to Budapest and we're going to cheer other people on. We're, we're edifying in the body of Christ. It was like we're cheering, we're cheering them on. We're cheering Pastor Maciek and Pastor Shopa, Pastor Mariusz and Pastor Tomas in Poland. We're cheering them on. We're cheering. It was like, it's like, keep, it's like this has value. This has eternal value, what we're doing. There's other sticks with names on it in Poland that can be reached. You know what I mean? This is, 
This is what we're doing, and we're, we're continually doing it. And we're in Bible school. And we're, I, I remember I, I, I wanted to, like, there was a time, like, like, uh, I, like, I wanted to learn how to pray, and I saw Pastor Schaller prayed for all the missionaries, right? And uh, <laughs> so I, I, I started studying the, uh, the globe so I could try to pray like Pastor Schaller. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, and it's like, so, you know, like, we do these strange things in our life. But uh, we, 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 want, we want God. We want God. And um, God's, God's using the Holy Spirit to do these things in our lives. So uh, um, um, well, we, I think we, we learned a lot in these, these, vi- these videos speak a lot, and let them speak to your heart. And uh, nobody's like disqualified. Nobody's disqualified when they get to know God from the work of God. Okay? And, um, okay, so uh, Father, Father, we, we pray for the, we pray for Budapest, Father. Father, you're, we pray that your son would be lifted up in Budapest. We just imagine that, that podium, that stage in Budapest, that, that Jesus Christ would be lifted up higher than ever. God, we pray that Jesus and the Holy Spirit, like in the book of Revelation, would just go from chair to chair, just like ministering to people, opening up their ears, taking away burdens. God, go from chair to chair in that in that in that hall, in that chapel, God, we pray. We pray that, that uh, leaders would be, would be uh, like drawn, like Pastor Shell has been saying, to your love. That burdens would be released, not by defining the burden, but defining who you are, God. We pray that the finished work, the finished work of Jesus Christ would bring deliverance and healing, God that it wouldn't be mechanical or that people wouldn't be expecting something mechanical or man-made or something really good like hewn out stones or like graven logs, God. We wouldn't worship that, but we would worship you, God. Let each speaker just give them words and thoughts even right now. God, we pray for Pastor Schaller. Where's Pastor Shabelli at? He's in Paris. Yeah. Um, we pray for um, Pastor Schaller in um, Ireland, Pastor Shabelli in Paris, in France, God, that, that uh, is, as he teaches there at that Bible school and those, that church, Lord, just uh, even raise up, like raise up people, like draw people to you, we pray, give people vision. Pray for Ireland, God. We pray for Ireland that um, uh, give us a foothold there, God. Give us a foothold there. Not that we know you perfectly or not that we have something really special to give people, but that we could give people you, God. We could give people you, God, in Ireland, we ask, Father. We could take people the message, Father, of of your saving grace, of your great grace, we pray. God, we pray for Pastor Angelonis in England. Pray for the group later going to Romania, God. Pray for the uh, Ukrainians coming, that they could get out of their country, Pastor Roman, that he could actually take a flight out of Kiev, God. We pray, like, even cause a miracle to happen there, even though they're going in the west direction, but still just uh, open up the borders, God, allow them to get there. Take people that are, weren't planning on going and, and take them, God, open a door for them, we pray. God, uh, Jen and, and Carol in, in Poland, bless their stay in Krakow, Lord, we pray for uh, the pastor, uh, Dave, in Lyon, France, God, we pray, make a way for him to come on the weekend. Lord, we pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise you. Thank you, God. 
open up our hearts to go, Father, to, 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 to believe, just to trust you that you can do the miracle, that you can do the miracle in our midst, God. We ask, Father, let, our, let us decrease and you increase, Father, we pray. God, give us uh, your mission heart, your mission heart for the lost, God. Let us remember there are sticks with names in them in every country, Lord, we pray. There's sticks with names on them, and they represent people in every country, God. There's, new, there's sticks in Denmark. There's sticks in Brussels, God, in, in Belgium. There's sticks there, God, we pray. God, there's sticks in Scotland. There's sticks in, in Ireland, God, we ask. Father, Father, just uh, quicken our church. Quicken our church these months as convention approaches with missions, with uh, your heart towards people, your heart towards uh, the people that you created and that you, you desire that they would know you and they would relate to you based upon your love, God. We ask, Lord, and thank you for cross-cultural evangelism and the warfare that exists and teach our hands to war and prepare us that we would be prepared for, for what we're not prepared for, God, we ask. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so you may go. We just, if you have a warm enough coat, if you're physically able, we'll be back at, at 9.30. If that's too late for you, you don't have to go. But if you're able to go, we're going to go with the teens. And, and on the bus, everything's taken care of. You don't have to take your car. They'll have a wrap down there, uh, a, sh a brief wrap at the end. And then we'll come back home, and you'll be back here at around 9:30. Is that is that okay with? I'm just it's it's whoever can. I mean, because I know I surprised you. You may not have a warm enough coat, or you know whatever. But there's what there you can ins go inside. So there's a lot of different opportunities. So Inner Harbor, we're going to Inner Harbor. Okay, so the bus is meeting down there underneath the canopy, underneath the.